Okay, I'm going to go ahead and admit everybody that's in the waiting room. Play the video, and then you can take it away from there. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Hello, I'm Eric Matisic, co-chair of Denver Startup Week. Last year, we were able to bring the global audience together for Denver Startup Week, and this year, we're excited to welcome that global audience back as we celebrate and showcase the best of entrepreneurship that the Denver ecosystem in Colorado has to offer. In Denver and beyond, there are lots to explore this week, but most importantly, we're excited that you're joining us. We have nearly 50 sponsor companies who contribute to make Denver Startup Week possible. Let's show our love for these companies today and all week long. Thanks to our headquarters and title sponsor, Amazon, and our title sponsors whose leadership makes this week come to life, Capital One Cafe, the Downtown Denver Partnership, Fluid Truck, Hotel Engine, and WeWork, and our track sponsors who've made all the great content you're hearing today possible, who, which includes our founder track sponsor, Kickstart, our growth track sponsor, Friday Health Plans, developer track sponsor, Quizlet, product track sponsor, Palantir, design track sponsor, Battery 621 and the Public Works, people track sponsor, Exactly, and the Spotlight event sponsor, Strat Labs. Our headline event sponsors are bringing this excitement to the entire week. Thank you to B-Side Fund, Colorado Public Radio, Comcast, Coors Brewing Company, Denver Pavilions, Entrepreneurship at the University of Denver, Gusto, J.P. Morgan Chase, Method, Moss Adams, Pi Insurance, Promontory Mortgage Path, Red Bull Basement, Southwest, Tattered Cover, and the VF Venture Foundry. Finally, thank you to our sponsors and member sponsors who are listed on the screen, and thank you for your support of Denver Startup Week. Now, let's get to it. Hmm. Hey boss, Mountain West, Q2 forecast, 2.3 million. And I'm Emma. We are the People Track co-chairs and members of the Denver Startup Week organizing committee. Thank you for joining us for the 10th anniversary of Denver Startup Week. At Denver Startup Week, we strive to make all of our sessions a space where attendees can connect, learn, and grow, regardless of age, gender identity, gender expression, race, ability, or sexual orientation. A special thank you to our sponsors for their support in helping us to keep Denver Startup Week free and accessible for all, especially our People Track sponsor, Exactly. On that note, please enjoy the session and the entire Denver Startup Week. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the People Track Panel Scaling and Evolving Culture in a High Growth Company. 
I'm super excited to be moderating this panel with a handful of, of great leaders. Um, we had a last minute addition. I want to welcome Young, uh, who's head of strategic partnerships uh, at AgentSync. Thanks so much for uh, being here with us. Um, we'll start off with some introductions um, of the panelists and then dive right into questions. So um, Young, we'd love to start with you. Yeah, hey, uh, I, I'm, my name's Young. Uh, my pronouns are they and he. And uh, yeah, I lead partnerships over at AgentSync. Uh, and I'll, I'll popcorn over to Lizzie because I know she's got our growth numbers ready. <laughs> Awesome. Hi, everyone. I am Lizzie Enderley Tubridey. My pronouns are she, her. I am our head of talent here at Agent Sync. We are a fast growing startup. We just reached 90 people and uh, will grow to about 200 next year. So really fun times. Um, we received our Series A at the beginning of this year. Um, so with our seed and Series A have raised just over 36 million, um, which is super exciting. Um, and yeah, we're really excited to be here. Thanks, Lizzie. Melissa. Hi, I'm Melissa Eaton. I'm the Vice President of Customer Success at Pi Insurance. I've been with Pi for about three years and um, my pronouns are she, her. And I do not want to steal the thunder about how we scaled and grown significantly. So I am going to shoot it over to Lori um, so she can share that great news. Melissa has been an amazing people and culture champion at Pi, so love celebrating her. Hi, everyone. My name is Laurie Putt Needleman. My pronouns are she and her. Um, I, like Melissa, have been with Pi for quite some time, um, actually since day one, which is a bit unusual in the people and talent seat. We can maybe talk more about that in the panel today. Um, Pi is a insure tech. Our primary product today is WorkComp. Um, more to come on that in the future. And we've been growing like crazy for the last, I would say, three years. Um, it's been an, an incredible, like, very exciting journey that um, I'm grateful to be on. I, I think I can say Melissa is as well. Um, and we're excited to share more with you all today about what we've learned in the last few years. Thanks, Lori. Allison, want to wrap this up? Hello. Hello, everyone. I'm Allison Meadows. I'm the Chief People Officer at Evolve. My pronouns are she, her. We are a hospitality company in the vacation rental industry. And over the past 15-ish months, we have doubled in size. We are now a team of 750 teammates strong based here in downtown Denver. So Dan, over to you. I think that wraps us up. Awesome. Thanks, Allison. And um, I'm Dan Snyder, head of talent at Pi. Um, quick couple of quick reminders before we, we jump in. If you have any questions, um, it looks like this um, is actually a Zoom meeting for everyone and not uh, sort of the webinar um, approach that we've taken. So um, let's drop questions right in the chat. And uh, Shannon, who's joining us from Pi, will help keep an eye on these questions. Um, we'll, we'll do our best to address them in real time. Um, so again, thanks for joining. Super excited to, to be here and to be moderating and to have everyone uh, join the panel. Um, we're going to start off with um, our first question. So looking back to when you first joined your company, uh, what is one thing that you wish you had done differently early on in your company's growth? Um, Lori, we'll start with you. Yep. Um, by the way, I'm going to preface this with uh, some of us I know are working in offices. Some of us are working from home. I'm at home today and I have two little ones and a dog. So hopefully nobody decides to make themselves known, but it is possible that they will. <laughs> so forgive me in advance for any interruptions. Um, all right. So uh, what one thing do I wish I had done differently early on in our company's growth? I actually have two things. One personal um, on my own um, kind of development and work and one organizationally. So personally, I, I made some investments in me um, in the first, I want to say it was like a year and a half to two years of joining Pi because I knew the role was going to be, it was going to bring me things that I hadn't done before. Um, so something that I did do was I participated in a coaching circle over a 12 month period with other HR leaders. And it was a great experience. What I didn't do and that I would wish I could go back and coach my younger self on and pass this knowledge on, especially to other people and talent leaders, is to find people who are having similar experiences to you 
so that you can share what you're going through because there's going to be tough moments in high growth um, and especially early stage startups. And, um, and that we can share ideas and resources and like, you know, what tools are you using or facing this problem? How did you work it through? So I've always had a really good network and I've prided myself on that. But the thing I didn't have are people that were going through my experience. And, um, and I was facing unique challenges that many people in my network had never faced before. And I was looking at tools or trying to find tools that would work at my scale that so many people in my network, like they, they were looking at bigger, more established things. So uh, when I got connected in 2020 to a group called CPOHQ, um, it's a, a chief people officer networking group. That was where I like, I struck gold and I found so many other people who were in similar stage of organizations and I could connect with them. And it also just felt like I had this whole community of people who kind of had my back in a way and I had theirs. And so it was a, a really great sense of community in that, in that way. So my, my advice on a, a personal level for someone who, um, is going through early growth startup is find your people <laughs> early, uh, early, as early as you can. Um, organizationally, I think something we struggled with at Pi, it showed up in um, one of our engagement survey scores, actually, and, and maybe you'll think these are loosely tied together, but I think they're closely tied together. So we scored low on um, how we manage meetings. And we didn't do a good job <laughs> of how we managed them. And I think it was tied to clarification around um, and a very overused word, but swim lanes, essentially. What, what is any single person responsible for? What do they get to make the calls on? And in an early stage startup, it seems really clear with the core group. And then you add, and all of a sudden it's 10 people is 20 and 20 people is 40 and 40 people is 80. And it becomes very unclear. So that's something I wish I, I had championed more early in the organization is clarifying those swim lanes. You especially see it in um, engineering product in the business, I think, um, from my experience in the last two companies I've been in. And I think one of the ways to, that we ended up like that, that indirectly solve for this is when we started putting more structure in meetings that we were running, um, that it became clear who owned meetings, who owned action items, and it clarified who owned entire swim lanes. So it was like a reverse engineering of, fi of fixing some of the problem. Um, so I would say two things that are in that um, clarification bucket are who owns what decisions and then refining it as you, you know, double or triple in size and how you organize and structure meetings so that there's clear ownership of, of who's doing what in the business. Awesome. Thanks so much, Lori. Um, before we move on, does anybody else on the panel want to uh, jump in with any other advice? I'm happy to chime in, Dan. Lori, great advice there. I think I'll do some quick hits personally and then organizationally. I think personally, no matter what phase of startup or growth, protecting your time is really important. Those meetings consume 40 hours a week and thankful that Google Calendar now tells you how many hours you're in those meetings, but be very thoughtful about blocking time for yourself to really think about those strategic initiatives you wanna to put together, that project plan you haven't had a chance to do. I think it's just really critical and it's easy to have that time uh, get sucked up by meetings. And then I think uh, organizationally, and to your point, Lori, I couldn't agree more around decision-making. We use a racing model here at Evolve, but we just actually implemented it recently. Um, who owns what decisions is so important and related to all of that, SOPs or documenting stuff, it's such the kind of annoying part, but man, does it really come in to help us all as we continue to grow? It's not like, what do we do? Who does what? documenting those decisions and the process behind it can be super helpful. So just wanted to tag on to Lori's great answer. That's great. Thanks so much, Allison. Um, we'll move on to the next question. So I'll preface this um, by saying, you know, I, I think everyone is well aware that we're in a, a highly competitive talent market right now. Um, the benefits that a, that a company, a team, or a leader offers um, plays a critical role in attracting new employees and, and retaining current employees. So the question is, what are some of the benefits that you or your company offer? Um, 
and what changes have been made uh, as our workplace has changed um, and evolved really since entering into the pandemic. Um, Allison, we'll start with you. Sure, thanks, Dan. First off, very proud that when I joined Evolve almost three years ago, a lot of great benefits were already in place. We have a 100% covered medical plan, dental plan, vision plan, 401k, et cetera. Looking back at the last year and a half, I think a couple of things bubbled up that we added to our great benefits plan to make sure we were really supporting the Evolver experience is what we call it. So I look back to a change we made early on in the pandemic, was, which was around bereavement leave. Many times it's very, it has to be a spouse, a partner, a child. And I think that it shouldn't have those conditions around it. Family is family, friends are friends, and not all relationships are equal in someone's life. And so we said, hey, if you have someone that you've lost, please go celebrate their life. It doesn't matter what they meant to you or from a title perspective on a, on a policy. Um, the other thing we've doubled down on is uh, really supporting mental health. So upping our EAP support and making sure that people have not just a couple initial sessions, but now up to eight sessions of connecting with a therapist that then they can get additional support and making sure that that's available for not just our teammates, but for their partner, spouse, children as well, their dependents, which I think has been a, a really great addition. And then the parents out there, I know Lori sounds like hopefully we don't get a visit, but I, I feel your pain. Um, we may have a dog visit me today, but uh, recently partnered with uh great startup called Kinside, which is helping connect parents to childcare and navigate the really tricky world that is out there. So really looking at how can we support our revolvers being the best selves, not just at home um, and work as well, and thinking through those uh, kind of big initiatives that we wanted to continue to support. So Lori, I think I know you, you've got some great ones that the team at Pi put in place too. Yeah, thanks, Allison. We've done some similar things to what you've done at Evolve. So uh, we also, when we've designed some of our LEAF programs, we don't define what family is for the team member. We have a really great caregiver LEAF program, and you can use it to take care of a close friend or a neighbor if you need to. Um, and it's the same uh, with bereavement leave, right? Like we, we're not going to say, oh, you get X number of days for this loss or that loss. You take the time that you need to grieve whatever loss you might have in your family or in your community. Um, we also do, we cover the premiums for our team members on uh, our health insurance programs, and that's been in place for a while. There are a couple of things that we are doing more, or we're doing differently in the pandemic. Um, I would say that we've expanded what flexibility looks like in the workplace, and I wouldn't call that a benefit or not even really a perk. It's just a necessity um, of where we are today, although while I consider it a necessity, sometimes I do talk to other organizations and other people in my role that they haven't been able to give that flexibility to their team members, um, and that, that hurts, right? It's hard to see that happening. So we've moved to a, a permanent hybrid remote strategy. I would say roughly 25% of our company today is spread throughout the country. So we now have people in 32 states. Um, for those of you on the panel, you know what that means, like from a regulatory and compliance perspective, like, oh, wow, it's definitely stretched us, but, uh, but, but we're learning as we go. Um, we implemented two things that I thought, or a couple of things that I thought were great. Um, again, this isn't a perk or a stipend. We moved to doing weekly um, all hands with our founders who are very transparent and super accessible um, and just really passionate about making sure that we're building the right culture for the organization. So we're getting lots of real-time information out there. They started that in the pandemic, so we moved from monthly to weekly. We established um, a home office stipend and we gave, give it to everybody. So even if you sit in Denver, DC, where our two offices are, and you're hybrid and you come into the office part-time, we still give you $350 up front, do what you need to, in addition to the standard, you know, pie equipment that we would give folks. And then we established what started as a tech stipend, say cover your Wi-Fi, things that you might need for your home office on an ongoing basis. 
And I always said, hey, if you want to use this for commuting, if you're coming back in, we're not like we're not going to take this away. Keep using it for work at home, you know, getting to a physical workspace. But really just use it how you see fit to support yourself in working. Um, so I think our team members have really appreciated those two things. Um, we've done some we've done some really awesome work around wellness. And I we have a, a culture ambassador team that um, Melissa, some other pie leaders, and myself helped to get up and running and support on an ongoing basis. I'm not going to go too far into it because I think Melissa probably has some exciting ones to share from uh, from what that team has done in the wellness space and in broader areas. Awesome. Thanks, Lori. Melissa, did you want? Yeah. So I was really going to talk a little bit about what has changed and evolved in terms of us as we've moved from a startup into a hyper growth company. And so thank you, Lori, for uh, teeing this up because this is perfect. Um, the, the biggest thing I would say that the move is from an organic build of culture to a more intentional build. And I would say that across the board. So what I mean by that is that when you're first starting out as a startup, you're scrappy, you're going for the smartest, the most experienced people that can get it done. And you're building teams um, very, very quickly. Now that we're plus 300 pioneers, um, I'm asking my leaders and I'm asking my team and myself to think about it in a very purposeful way. What is the intent of the team and the member and their role and what are they contributing and how are they bringing value to our overarching vision and missions? And that's a little different. And that's also how we want to curate our culture. So when you think about how you're navigating things as you grow in, a, in this really, you know, like I said, hyper growth world, you do have to be a little more thoughtful and intentional about how you build culture. And so one of the things that we are doing is we're looking at ways to use integrated thinking. So really, you know, the diversity of thought of all, all experiences and all different types of people um, and what they can bring to the table. And we're actually in the process of revamping and updating our culture ambassadors in that program. And part of what was really kind of brought to the forefront in the pandemic was we went from like less than 150 pioneers to over 300 currently. So we've grown that team. And a lot of those team members have never been to an office, not even close to an office. They don't live in the same state. Um, and so we've had to really figure out what are the important things and what are the fundamental pillars of culture. And so, um, with Black Lives Matters, like a lot of things went on in the last year and a half for all of us. And so we've really kind of moved our culture ambassadors into three different er arenas. Um, we're really focused on mentorship, which is really important, right? How you personally and professionally develop um, your team members. Uh, we're also really focused on DEI. So this is, you know, diversity, um, equity, inclusion, all of those things are so important and they're very important to all of us as people and as humans and what we bring to the table. And we also wanna show up that way as a company. So we are really going to focus and lean heavily into that with um, groups such as, uh, you know, a women's professional group, we're going to, we have, you know, um, Pie Pride, we have a lot of different things going on. So we're really excited about that. Um, and then the last one is around wellness, which is what Lori was talking about. So we used to have um, a, a group that focused on service. And a lot of times when you think of service, you think of community service, you think about giving to others. And really during the pandemic, um, uh, the people team at Pi did an amazing job to really like keep a pulse on what was going on within the team members and knowing that like, hey, we need a mental health uh, health day, right? And we need to almost force our pioneers to take a day off. Um, we need to have uh, meditation time. And so we had recorded and facilitated meditation services. We had yoga. We had a lot of different kinds of things and, and, and different aspects of it. We even had group therapy, um, which was fantastic. And the pioneers that participated, um, all of them have said that this is one of the things that they've 
that sh has shown the leadership cares um, that we're listening and that we're in tune with, um, like I said, the underlying pulse of the company. And I think this is where culture is going um, in the future is that you have to keep in mind all of those things that create the whole. And so that's one of the areas that we've really been working on. Glad to share with you. That's great, Melissa. Thanks Thanks so much for sharing all of that. Um, it, it leads into the, the next question um, a little bit more broadly stated, um, and, and I don't want to make this all about the pandemic, but it's been a really interesting, you know, it feels like coming up on two years now um, for all of us. So um, how has the past year and a half changed um, how you just think about culture? Um, and, and we'll open this up to, um, to the whole panel. Um, but Lizzie, we'll start with you. Yeah, thank you. I it's been an interesting and wild two years. Um, I think that's like the biggest understatement. Um, but when I think about culture first, it's really being clear what culture is because I think it's a very broad word. And so for us at AgentSync, we think about culture as the principles and values of how you operate, how you work as a company, how you interact, and you bring that into your hiring practices too. So you're really looking for that alignment and being a strong culture addition um, when you hire. Um, but when I kind of think about how things have evolved, and I've been someone who, um, like I think many, many people in this um, session, I switched jobs during the pandemic and thought a lot about what's important to me. And I think what's really come to the forefront with all the things that we have seen is, is values and caring about um, how companies think about balance. And if you're a parent, I'm a, I'm a three-year-old. So what that experience is like um, and how you make space for people, um, how you think about boundary setting, how you think about prioritization and what we've seen with this racial reckoning that we are still going through is how as a white person, I identify as a white person, how I take more time to listen and learn from others too. And I think that that is something that a lot of companies are seeing more at the forefront too, is how do we, how do we make space? How do we listen? How do we learn from others? So could keep going, but I'll try to make some space for other people to join in in this conversation too. But um, it's really evolved how I define culture what I prioritize, what I care about personally, but then also as a company, how do I make sure that people are able to see if the company is the right place for them too, and if they'll feel safe and supported in their work too. Yeah, I think more and more, um, you know, as we, as we get more and more young people into the workforce, their values are completely different. Right. I mean, millennials, my generation, are by far the largest segment within the workforce today. And 90% of millennials would take a pay cut to get better respect and values within their organizations. And I think that's really important for us to understand, especially as we start to shift some of the existing norms around work, 40 hour work week, work hard. Um, the reality is we have to adjust as organizations and as leaders to the, the values of the people that we work with and because we also work for them. And when we look at young people with impending climate crisis, with a massive class divide that is only growing and getting worse, the world's just not incredibly exciting for a lot of young people and the young people that I talk with and the people who are part of our organization as well as uh, other organizations that I'm a part of. And what, what I think the pandemic has done isn't necessarily created a dynamic for us to think about these things, but it has accelerated that because in the face of quarantine, people dying, all this uh, just really scary news about the world while we are literally on fire here in Colorado, um, the reality is it's accelerated the thinking and especially for us older folks, um, to be able to think about these things in the same way as our peers that are younger. And, um, and it's brought a lot of that to the forefront. And we have now, of course, the, the 
you know, this reckoning of everyone kind of stepping out of the workplace um, and, and really setting their boundaries and something I'm really proud of, of this next generation that they have amazing, amazing boundaries with not just their work, but their lives. And the companies that can adjust and shift and grow into that and help shift our work culture as a, as a society to meet the needs of people who don't have a lot to look forward to, I think is, is incredibly important and is what sets us apart, you know, organizations like, like the folks on this panel um, from organizations that aren't necessarily addressing and meeting those needs and creating less accepting work environments for, for the, the next generation of workers. I think Young and Lizzie bring up a really, really important component, which is the lines have been blurred. So between work and life, right? Um, and I think the one thing that I, I know at Pi that we have really tried to embrace is that human component of of everybody's reactions, perspectives, their feedback, um, their, you know, how they connect to what's going on in the world. Cause you know, oh my gosh, there's, there's been just so it's been, it's been crazy. There's just been so much that's been going on. And so when we acknowledge that and we're willing to let that also drive the narrative at work, you get um, like, you know, I mentioned integrated thinking, you know, you get such much more richer conversations, more real conversations. And you look to um, increase these innovative solutions and you're getting them from an, an array of people that are, are, they care, we all have the same goals in mind, but we all have different ways that we look at something. And I think that that's one of the things that I think as a leadership team, we've been so um, proud of seeing how people have been able to come together and how you've been able to listen to Lizzie's point, you know, really to learn and, and, and to recognize, you know, there's unconscious bias everywhere and there's bias. There's not even just unconscious bias, there's bias everywhere. And how you approach your work and how you approach your family, I mean, and how you approach your friends and your community, it's so important. And that's really what's lending into the, the like I said, the fundamental foundation of a company now is culture, um, more so than it's ever been, more so than it's ever been. And, oh, sorry. Oh, go, <laughs> go ahead, Lori. I was going to say, I almost have like a follow-on question for the panel, and I'll share a, a personal experience, which is in, in my history, like even before we were living in this, this new world, is I want to give a thousand percent to a leader and a team who sees me as a whole person. And when I have that permission to bring my entire self, including the baggage of, you know, my children, my family, like the things I'm facing in my personal life, not all of it, but some of it with me to work and still feel like that's okay. I, I want to give even more. And I'm wondering like how you guys have experienced this in your careers, like, uh, you know, everyone on the panel of, you know, being seen as an entire human in the workplace and when and where that's been permissible, or maybe, maybe you felt like it hasn't been and how that's impacted you. I'll, uh, <laughs> Oh, go, no, ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead. No, no, no. You, 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 you were going a second earlier. You should go. I was, I was going to pivot based on Lori's uh, follow-up question. Oh, there. got it. Then I will add on. <laughs> yeah. Um, go for or, it. So, I think um, I'll speak a little bit to, to my experience. I think uh, it, Lori, you, you really spoke to something that I think is incredibly important to me is bringing, being able to bring your whole self to work. It's something that um, at, at a previous company, I had worked with our DEI council to create that as our primary mission. But that mission was delivered by a white woman who had caused myself and two other BIPOC men to quit the company. And then subsequently founded a women's ERG with a slide that said, we're not a white feminist organization, followed by a leadership slide that had eight white women as the leaders of a company that was 44% BIPOC. So, that is historically the way that many of us experience DEI is that, and I said this recently um, publicly, 99% of 
diversity, equity, inclusion is reskin colonialism. And it can be even more painful than just the straight up racism or the straight up isms, right? Because now it's under the guise of something that is benefiting us. And that's uh, almost worse, right? Um, and I'll say that I've never felt okay, especially as a trans person and a trans person who spent most of my life identifying as a man to bring my whole self to work. And that's still very uncomfortable, especially in you know more conservative spaces. Um, and one of the reasons I joined Agent Sync is, is specifically because I felt so welcome and safe talking to our founders, talking to the team. And I'll, and I'll say it's, it's something that I'm very proud of uh, is the culture that we've built of inclusion and of people being able to be themselves. And it's why I also see it as a responsibility as a leader who can be myself publicly and whether, like not, not face consequences, because I still do, but whether those consequences because of my station, because of what I've achieved in my career and because of my earning potential. Um, being able to recognize that what what other people tell you about themselves is true, no matter what you think about that other person, I think is like the most critical thing that all of us need to do. And what you're really talking about is psychological safety, right? And the reality is it's really hard. It's fucking hard to do work and be productive when you're not safe. And that's what we're talking about. And that's what we're finally bringing into the worldwide conversation. People are starting to recognize that, oh my God, maybe black people experience racism. <laughs> like that, that's actually a thing that's now front and center. And that must be very validating for as an Asian. This also happened concurrently with my people as a Chinese person dying in a pandemic. And before it became clear that that was going to impact us as Americans, the response was to turn into a bit. So Asians everywhere were experiencing our colleagues and coworkers making jokes about our food, saying that we eat bats, after already experiencing that we're asked whether we eat dog, right? Uh, and then and all of these kind of jokes about COVID actually had an impact on many of us to create psychological danger because we're here worrying about our families while our friends make jokes about it in the workplace. And I think I bring that up because it's important for everyone listening to be thinking about for the past year, how many times have you heard these things? How many times did you say them yourselves? How many times did you accept it? And it's not to say you need to beat yourself up, but you do need to listen, as Lizzie mentioned, and then move forward understanding that those things were painful, hurtful, and that they created a work environment that was very dangerous for a lot of people and therefore less productive, which then means that we actually end up having worse career outcomes as a result, right? And that's the, that's the impact broadly of marginalization. So, so thank you for bringing that up, Lori. Thanks for being willing to share. Yeah, agree. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Young. So, so real. So we appreciate you sharing your experiences. Um, before we move on to the to the next question, Allison, um, I know we you had a couple things to say. <laughs> okay, I think it'll actually wrap up wrap it up nicely. I think what we all just shared also just puts an emphasis on our leadership and not just executive leadership, but all of our people leaders and how we can continue to support them and give them the resources to make sure everyone can show up as their authentic self at work. Some areas we've invested in, psychological safety training for all of our people leaders, offered up a mental health first aid um, session for people leaders, because I think what, what I was planning to share a couple of moments ago was it's, it's hard when everything has been over Zoom. I'm a people person. And when individuals would show up, and even if I had no meetings with them, I could tell if they were having a great day or a bad day, and I could ask them about that. So those connections where it's, hey, I, I can tell you're down today. What, what's going on? We have to be, to Melissa's point, more intentional, intentional about those conversations and our people leaders need to ask more than they ever have before in order to check in and not just on the professional side, but on the personal side. So it's, you know, being authentic, Lori, to your point, I'm a soccer coach with my six-year-old. I put it on my calendar and I say, coaching job, you've got to be upfront about who you really are. And if people have questions, comments, concerns, then bring it up. But I, I suggest everyone block it out, be transparent when there's things you need in order to show up um, to, to both sides of your life. So hopefully, Dan, that I think wrapped it up for, for that one, but that, that we could go on for sure. I think that wraps it up very nicely. So th thanks, Allison. Um, we did get a, a, a great question that came in. So I'll just ask this to the group before we jump into um, to the next one that I had. 
So um, do you have any tips for a startup that, that's experiencing a lot of growth or change on how to retain a strong united culture? For example, day-to-day -day ways to reinforce culture as well as think ahead and be proactive about maintaining strong unification and commitment to values. It's in the chat. If, uh... I would say if, if you as an organization haven't written down your values and done that together as an entire team to see if it resonates, do that. And then you really deeply ingrain that into the way that you work and how you interact and find a language to call it out when you're not acting that way. Um, as an example, we, and I think probably every company in this group values collaboration and being team oriented. So if you're seeing behaviors that aren't that way, find a way to, in the most caring way, call it out and find a language for that. Um, at a previous company, we had developed just great framework for like, not okay, okay. And like really just like bringing people back to what's acceptable behavior um, for how you want to work and how you want to be inclusive and thoughtful. And then I think kind of bringing us back a little bit to the topic of, I think the goal is that people can feel comfortable to bring their whole selves, their authentic self. I don't take that for granted. And I don't think any people leader or a leader should think that that's something you can assume people feel comfortable with. So I think more focus on psychological safety and finding ways to give people outlets and safe places to go to, to talk to, to share feedback anonymously, publicly, and ask for that. And then when you start hearing that, listen, just like pause and create space for someone to speak up about things and give that platform to hear that. So, I would agree with what Lizzie had to say here. I would also say that um, really like embedding those shared values and those core values in your day to day, it's not necessarily always the easiest thing to do. And like, I loved how um, um, Lizzie said, you know, make sure that you say something immediately when you see people not doing that, right? But at the same time, also celebrate when they are modeling it and that they're showing, showing it. I think the other thing is making sure there's alignment on them. Um, because as you grow quickly, people have different versions of what, you know, a trust means or respect means, or uh, teamwork and collaboration mean, ownership means. And if we're not aligned, especially from a leadership perspective, and you start, start to see leaders modeling a different sort of behavior and putting more emphasis and priority on one value over another, that can cause uh, fissures within the organization and can cause, I mean, we all are competitive. The, all, all of us here are competitive. We all want to win. I know that, but there are ways in which you want to win and the, and the how is just as important as the end goal. And that's one of the things that I share with my team, right? Like we have KPIs and metrics. And so, yeah, you have a number to hit. You have those kinds of pr productivity measures and results, but how you do the work and how you show up for the team and how you show up for our customers every single day, that matters just as much to me as what you did. So I do think that like being able to kind of really have your values be more than what you post in the bathroom. I think that's, where, you know, you, you've seen companies like that where, it, you know, it's just posted on the back of the, uh, on the bathroom stall. Um, that's great. It, it's great if it's a sticker, if it's, you know, whatever it might be. But I think that living those values is really what's important. And, and it's hard to build the culture and you should always, I think, continually look at it like what we're doing at Pi, where we're, you know, we're really looking at being more intentional now that we're past that startup stage, so. I have a handful of very, like, very minute specific things that might help with the, the person's question. Um, I'm going to go back to this, something that we did at Pi um, that was a problem area for us. You need to identify what your problem area is. You can do that through an engagement survey, and we work with your people and culture team. If you're not doing an engagement survey, I, I would recommend putting that in place so you can figure out like what where are the things because sometimes you think people are happy about all this stuff and then you find out it's actually 
It's actually a focus area that you should work on. So do an engagement survey, figure it out what your areas are. One of our areas was meetings, right? Like how we work together across teams, how we spend time in meetings, et cetera. So we got a group of leaders together, talked it out, figured like, let's do these things. We put them into practice, see, we saw how they worked. We codified them, we published them, rolled them out to the whole org and then build it into our onboarding process. So that sounds so small, but one of the main ways we interact is through meetings. And so having some practices about you, how you engage with each other beyond just your values is important. Um, and it might be something that, that could help, uh, help you. The other thing I would say is how are you doing your all hands? Like how are you communicating across the org? What's the frequency? Who runs them? Who plans them? Do they have an element of like fun and celebration in addition to getting information out? And making sure there's a point person or team that is responsible for getting all of the information together and planning it and getting out the door. The, the moment when we made some of those shifts and how we were running our all hands, we just like, we, we've got some real wins on engagement and how we were able to get really timely, impactful information distributed across the org, even when we were kind of small. I'm talking about like 130, 140 people, right? It's not a huge organization. So those are some of the things that I think you can keep your focus on culture and then you can weave in references to your values, key decisions you're making and why they're important. And if your leaders are losing sight of that, or if you're in an organization like ours where you have founders, having a conversation of when we tee this up, can we talk about how this aligns to these two values? Because even as leaders, um, we need reminders sometimes of like, hey, can you stand over here, right? A little bit of stage direction. Can you go back and put more makeup on or change your costume, right? Like we, we don't see everything. So no empowering everyone around you to say, hey, let's remember to do these things like weaving culture into, we, weaving culture and values into our dialogue as an organization. Or a one, one a quick addition to those tactical pieces of advice, mm -hmm. the orientation and onboarding, so important as the foundation to like get a teammate ready to go and to understand all the things, Lizzie, you were talking about. We've invested heavily there and iterated throughout our growth because there's no better time to set someone up for success and to tell them about those values and behaviors and how things work in order to make sure they can continue to add to the culture as well as continue to carry those values forward as we grow. So if you aren't investing there and you feel like it's just a, we've got to get the I-9 done and make sure we can pay them appropriately, that would be a good place to start. And in this virtual world, what Allison brings up is so important because Really, when you onboard now, you're not necessarily onboarding an entire group of people in, a, in, in your office space. And so being able to set that stage for a connection is so important. You know, one of the, the, one of the big uh, pillars that our culture ambassadors focus on is mentorship. And for the onboarding component of it, we assign a pie pal. I'm sorry about all the pieisms. That's how we operate there at Pi. Um, so we assign a, uh, you know, an onboarding, you know, uh, somebody to ask questions. They're not not necessarily on your team, right? Um, and we talk about like all the different ways we can connect with people um, in the onboarding session that I uh, promote, which is customer success and customer experience. Um, I could talk about all the different you know, things that go on within functionally within my team. But one of the things I always like to talk about is culture. And I also like to talk about how do you connect with um, a, a company of 300 or even a company of 30 when you don't get to meet them face to face? Um, we use Slack and I tell them, I say, you need to become Melissa troll all the Slack channels and browse all of them because there are amazing Slack channels out there. And this is how you are going to meet people that aren't on your team that you would have met at the coffee maker, right? That you would have met like having lunch together, having, you know, going down to the taco truck or whatever. So what you need to do is like, look at that and having that ability to find connections in a really diverse world. Um, it's been fantastic. You know, like there's, 
there's the, the channel of everything that's on TV. There's the channel for, we're kind of laughing about this. This is one of my favorite channels is we have a marketing director in, in DC and he raises ants and he has Sean's ant blog. And I'm, I tell people, I'm like, you got to go to Sean's ant blog. He's got videos of ants. It's like crazy. Now people are posting pictures of ants that are crawling around their patio. Like Sean, what is this? You know, that kind of thing. But it's, it's a great way to connect people. And I think the being able to connect people across the board today is the toughest, toughest thing. And so understanding where those opportunities are to do better. So through surveys, through conversations, um, you know, you have to be completely intentional, but you're right. Like you used to be able to see when someone was shoulder slumped down or sitting with their hoodie, you know, in the corner, not happy, you know, now you don't know that you have to like make, you have to make an effort and leaders have to make efforts. One thing that I think everyone on this um, panel has responded with uh, to, to this question specifically is, is investment. You have to intentionally invest time and energy into building culture. And if you don't, because it's often seen as a soft thing or an afterthought, then culture change is much, much more challenging than culture build. So if you invest the time now, even though you're rapidly growing, even though you have to meet customer needs, even though your product roadmap is like quarters behind, you do have to invest that time if you plan to be a scalable business in the future. Um, one of my more recent consulting gigs before I joined Agent Sync was coming on to a 1200 person um, startup that had uh, evolved way too fast and not evolved at all internally. Um, it became a $3 billion business uh, very, very quickly. And uh, I was brought in to help shift the culture of an 80 person technical services organization. And um, I'll tell you one of the first things I had to do was shut down an internal uh, Slack that not only this team, but uh, the broader org as well as leaders were participants in that was dedicated to making fun of customers. The entire thing was literally just mocking customers, uh, making fun of their accents. It was, it was bad. And it was a, such a battle to get that channel removed because that culture had run away so far that this was part of the culture. And I will say I ultimately failed in that job because that ship was really hard to turn around. Um, so if you do not invest the time now, if you do not put the energy and attention into what Melissa was just talking about, intentional change rather than organic change, and I think Lori talked about swim lanes, you, we're at a stage at Agent Sync where we need to shift from a like people-led organization, which is how it works when you're 30 and you can use a lot of implicit communication implicit culture to a function-led organization where you now have swim lanes you now have people not wearing all the hats you have people putting on certain hats and collaborating functionally inter interdependently to be able to work and create the new outcomes and i think that's one of the most exciting stages of growth in a high growth business is figuring out how do you how do you take this rocket ship and jettison the propulsion engines because you found made it out of orbit and now you're on the long haul, right? How do you make that transition? Um, and, and, and the answer truly is, I think across the board from everyone's answers here, intentionally. That's my response. Thanks, Young. Well, we um, we're, we're have just about just over five minutes left. Um, we didn't get to get to um, cover all the questions that we had, but I do want to try and wrap up with two two more questions. So. Um, we'll keep this one short, but um, what would you recommend to someone who is thinking about joining or coming into an early stage high growth um, company? And we'll start with um, Allison on this one. Sure. My quick piece of advice is what I call learn laterally. It's not about climbing a ladder. Build your business acumen. Be curious about other teams. Go learn something new, it will all make you stronger and make you uh, a even better contributor, leader, et cetera. So learn laterally is my piece of advice. I would build on that. And I would say with that, you have to be ready to work, be ready to do the work. Um, and that also means check your ego at the door. And the reason I say check your ego at the door is that the best way to be better 
is to ask for help when you need it and ask for guidance and ask for input and ask others to join you on a journey. And so that sometimes is not, uh, especially for a lot of us who are very highly motivated and, and highly driven and disciplined, um, we look at our own um, results and performance as showcasing that we're good enough. And what I would say to all of you is, you know, to be ready, to work hard, to do the hard work, to ask for help, um, and also to be able to understand yourself. I think that that's the one thing I really talk a lot about to I, kids who are in the workforce too, um, you know, to my children as well. And I, I, I also call my team my children. Um, my team members and my leaders is that you have to be able to find your voice and really know and advocate for yourself just as much as you're going to advocate for the customer, you advocate for your team, advocate for the company. But really at your core, you really know, you have to know what is what are the drivers that make you better. So that's what I would add to what Allison had to say. I would throw in accountability. Mm -hmm. Be ready to be accountable. If you are coming in, especially from a more, more enterprise, mature organization, and you haven't really worked in, in fast-paced, undefined startup world, you need to recognize that you are accountable for the outcomes. Your role will not be incredibly defined. It will shift. It will change. But no matter what, you're accountable for the outcome, and there are no excuses in a startup environment. You need to make it work, and sometimes you have to create that accountability for yourself and manage that with other uh, teams and organizations as well. Yeah, I think what I've observed most is just this being really comfortable with ambiguity, with iterating as you go. A lot of early stage, high growth, you are building the function as you're doing the work. I think if you have people there who've been there before you, listen to them and get their advice. And then every new person you bring in, get their advice too, because you're getting all of these new perspectives and you're building it all together. So I think be comfortable with ambiguity and change, iterating as you go, be okay with not, we talk at Agents Think about speed over perfection. It's not going to be perfect. You're going to evolve and learn more as you go. And that's great. So I think those are my big ones. Thanks, Lizzie. Well, um, we'll, we'll wrap up with one last question. And um, that's what's, what's one piece of advice that you have for the audience um, to stay grounded in 2022? I'll go first, find a way to pay it forward. Um, whenever I'm feeling super stressed and my well is empty, I find a way to, to give to somebody else. And one of the ways that I do that is men a mentoring conversation, something like that. Um, I don't mean just giving back in your community. So pay it forward, fill your well. It's amazing. Love that. Thanks, Lori. Similar take that Slack or email and turn it into a quick five minute connection over Zoom or Slack and just see that person and make that connection, which I know we've been talking about. Those five minutes really are impactful and fill your cup throughout the week. Um, I would also say, give yourself grace. Um, this is a tough time. And, and if you give yourself grace, it will be easy for you to give others the same. And we all deserve it. I would say consume um, and consume consciously. And what I mean by that is, is consumption of thought. So pay attention to TikTokers, read books, but pay attention to who you're reading and make sure that that, that, that authorship is diverse because we are entering a world where we care about this more and more and you don't wanna be left behind. Um, it will help you connect with the people around you in ways that you maybe haven't in the past. Yes, I love that so much. Just listen, try and listen a lot more than you talk. And I don't know if you're like me, all the comfort food, pasta, it's really great to stay grounded. Cheetos, I love Cheetos. <laughs> hot Cheetos. Oh, or hot. hot. Or I'll lime take... hot Cheetos. Ooh, I haven't tried <laughs> <one of those. laughs> Love it. <laughs> Um, well, seriously, cannot thank you all enough. Um, great discussion. Everyone who is on the, on the call, thank you so much for joining. 
Um, if you have any other questions for myself or for the group, feel free to reach out, connect with us on LinkedIn. Um, I know we're all hiring. Check out our careers <laughs> page, um, selfish plug. Um, but thanks again and hope you enjoy the rest of um, Denver Startup Week. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Dan. Everyone.